Hello! Welcome to another Zosin session. How about that? I bet you didn't expect that shit to happen. So uh, let me adjust my window and everything just to make sure that everything is good. And today, the topic of today's stream is uh, a simple literate programming uh, system in C. So, which is rather interesting. So I don't think, uh, as far as I know, nobody actually got the idea of literate programming right. And neither we are, we go, how to say that, neither we're going to as well. How to say that <laughs> anyway so and we're also not gonna get it right but we're gonna get some sort of like approximation to the uh literate programming idea so let's actually try to google that literate literate programming right so what is a literate programming so it's a thing that was invented uh, by uh donald knuth right the creator of the uh four large books that nobody reads uh the creator of, of things like latex and metafont and stuff like that so yeah th that guy right so um basically it's a programming introduced by donald knuth in which computer program is given an explanation of its logic in a natural language such as in english interspersed with snippets of macros and traditional source code from which the compilable source code can be generated you you describe the uh the program in a natural language but you also sneak a little bit of code in there and you have a special system that takes this thing and can generate uh, a readable human readable documentation and executable program from the same thing right so uh maybe you can describe it with a with a little diagram some sort of a little diagram so let's wait uh for my paint and uh you basically have a single source code so it's going to be soc let's actually pick a green color a nice green color s r s r c so here is your src and from that src you can for example generate uh a basically a tech file of a book that is documentation for your program right that is documentation for your program or uh you can generate uh, also the c code the c code that is executable version of that program so it wording it this way actually makes it sound like you know like a java doc system do you guys are you guys familiar with the java doc right so um essentially uh it's a, I think Java introduced this system first, where you can annotate methods and stuff like that, and then uh, generate documentation from that methods. So I wonder um, if Javadoc is a tool that you can just call like that. Apparently it, it is not, so I probably have to do it like that. I do remember that I had uh, JVM somewhere. So here is the name, so JDK. So then I can go to here. And do I have a thing that can generate stuff for me? So yeah, here's a Java doc. So I can use this entire thing to, uh, to generate docs. So if I go there, uh, for example, I'm gonna do something like probe, uh, Java doc probe, uh, right? So, and if I go in here, right? So main, not mean, main.java, right? So let's program in Java a little bit. Do you guys like Java? Uh, Java is actually awesome language, my favorite language of all time. Oh. So okay, can you even see what the fuck is going on? I think this this one is actually not really readable. Uh, right, so let's actually open that in Emacs. Mm, now that's what I call a readable code. And then public static uh, static void main. Then we have arguments. So this is going to be that. And then system out println then uh hello world right so and then i can compile the entire thing um into a class right so i don't even have a java a java c so the thing i probably need to do i probably need to enter some sort of like a environment for java i do remember that i had something like that uh so if i take a look at opt uh, yes so here is the java environment and i can quite easily just do something like this and if i do which 
Java, so I have the latest JDK. So I can turn this entire thing into a Java class, right? So it will take some time, but we'll turn it into a Java class. There we go. So here is the Java class. You can see it's bigger than the original source code, but I mean, that's fine. That's usually the case. Uh, and then if I run it, it says hello world, right? So then you can run a uh, Java doc on this entire thing. I think this is how you use it. I don't remember uh, like how to use it properly, but I'm going to try to do that. So it's loading the source and it generated the doc documentation and it generates a shit ton of HTML files. Like holy fucking shit. That's all the HTML files. So then you can open this entire thing. Uh, does it generate index? Uh, I think it also generates an index and there you go. You have documentation for your program. So here is your main class and here is your main method and so on and so forth. And furthermore, if I remember correctly, you can now put shit in here. Right. So uh, the entry point to the program, right, something like that. And then you can close it in here. And then you can have things like param, right, uh, args and say something like arguments, arguments to the program, right. So, and you can have like these, um, you know, s small uh, comments, right. So these kind of small comments and can we regenerate javadoc from that? So it will construct javadoc and everything. And let's take a look at what we've got. And uh, if I go into the main method, into the main method, uh, here it is. Here is the documentation, the entry point for the program. Here is the parameters, args, arguments to the program, and so on and so forth. And you can write, I think there you can use a markdown language in here. Rust has a similar system. Like a lot of modern languages have a similar systems these days. And the first time I saw this system, I think it was in Java. I don't know who introduced this system. Maybe it was the, the Sun Microsystem who invented that, but maybe not. I don't know. So this kind of thing sort of fits into the definition of literate programming. So you have a single thing and from that single thing, you can create an executable program. Maybe, maybe in this particular case, maybe in this particular case, we want to say something like .exe, right? For, for the binary executable. And then you have a documentation. So in that case, it's going to be something uh, like HTML, uh, right? Well, I mean, in our case, it actually turned out to be class. So let's actually be a little bit more precise. So it's kind of is a literate programming system if we're using just that definition from Wikipedia. But um, from what I heard, it is really not. Because, um, so uh, again, as I already said, I heard a lot of rumors that everyone gets the idea of literate programming wrong. And this is, this is basically the case. If I remember correctly, the original idea was that you can have snippets in whatever order and they can cross-reference them, uh, cross-reference each other in a particular graph and the tool actually collects that graph and sort of uh, untangles it and constructs either documentation or a program or something like that. It's actually a very complicated idea, but since uh, it's yet another Knuth idea that nobody understood, so nobody understood it. Um, all right, so maybe uh, we could read about that. Maybe there's some diagrams that indicate. So, by the way, the system uh, that uh, uses, like, um, that first implemented um, literary programming was called Web, right? So it was before Web was a thing. That's how old it is, right? It's before Web was a thing. Uh, that's why it was called like that. Um, so it's pro probably to actually sort of indicate that it's a semantic web of, of something or whatever. So I, I don't really know what's up with that. So um, so there's a, a documentation or, or workflow. Uh, oh, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting. So implementing little programming consists of two steps. Uh, weaving, generating a comprehensive document about the program and its maintenance. Tangling, generating machine uh, executable code. Uh, weaving and tangling are done on the same source so they, uh, that they are consistent uh, with each other, right? So, and that's why it's called web, because you're weaving and tangling or something like that, some sort of a pan, a pun, I mean. Um, oh yeah, this is how it's supposed to look like, apparently. So you have uh, some sort of human readable code, then you have chunks of executable code, uh, and there's some sort of macros in here, I suppose, scan line, field buffer, something, something, something. And uh, your actual program and documentation is supposed to be, um, you know, built from that. In any case, uh, what I'm going to be doing, 
I'm not going to be implementing this literate programming, right? So I'm going to put the uh, link to the literate programming uh, in the description. So here it is, here it is, Wikipedia uh, uh, article on literate programming. So I'm going to implement the idea um, from Haskell's literate programming. So Haskell has um, basically uh, a take on literate programming. Uh, literate programming. So let's take a look at it. So, and it's very simple. Um, it is extremely, extremely simple. So you write uh, so-called LHS styles, uh, LHS files, files, oh my God. Uh, LHS files, which look like a uh, latex document. So let's actually take a look at them. So uh, I'm gonna go to prob uh, and I'm gonna do LHS. Uh, and in here I can create an LHS file. Mm -hmm. So, and in here you can start uh, creating a document, right? So this is gonna be a, a document, uh, right? So I think it's something like an article, right? Um, how do you start the document? Does anyone remember? I haven't used the later for quite some time. Do you do begin document? Is that is that how we do that? Uh, okay, so nobody's gonna help me. Uh, document. Okay, so thank you. All right. So begin document, and then you can put your stuff in there. Uh, all right. So hello uh, world. All right, and then you can run PDF later uh, main LHS. Right, so, and it didn't really work because there's no such thing in there. Okay, so, uh, it is, is it, is it an article? I think it's a document class, if I remember correctly, or something like that. Okay, I need to Google that later. Um, uh, document class, okay. Uh, so let's try to recompile this entire thing. And there we go, we have a PDF document. Uh, we have a PDF document, there we go. So we have article and hello world. So what's up with this entire thing? Well, if you write something like begin code and end code, you can stick a Haskell code in here. All right. So, and um, obviously if you try to compile this entire thing with later, it's not gonna uh, work because you don't have the code environment yet. So I think you have to create the code environment first to actually be able to use it. Um, to, 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 to. So I think um, this in package, another alternative is to use, well, yeah, the easiest thing is to just create a code environment uh, and you know, to be ver verbatim, verbatim. I don't know how to pronounce this thing, uh, but I'm gonna just stick it in here. All right, so I think I have to put it in here. And that way uh, it is going to compile, hopefully. Right, so, and then if I open this entire thing, right, uh, here is the Haskell code. Oh my God, I, I can't, I can do that. Okay, so here's the Haskell code and on top of that, uh, you can write some um, some documentation in here. So let's actually try to do something like put strln uh, hello world, right? So section uh, hello uh, world um, world in Haskell. Hello world in Haskell. This is how you write the famous uh, hello world um, program in Haskell, right? And then you have this code environment. And then if you recompile the entire thing, you refresh it, there you go. You have some sort of an article that talks about uh, how to write hello world in Haskell. But here's an interesting thing. I'm in a lit Haskell mode bird, whatever that's supposed to mean, but lit Haskell mode. And you can see that the Haskell code is highlighted in here. And LHS is uh, an extension that Haskell compiler does recognize. So if I do something like um, uh, run GHC main LHS, it will take some time because, I mean, GHC, I need to load up. Um, so I wonder how much time it will take. It will uh, run Hello World. So essentially, you have a single document from which you can produce 
sort of an article documentation and which you can compile as a program so that's the basically uh a liter a literate programming take uh in haskell right so this is basically what they do maybe there is more than that but that's basically it but the idea is actually super simple uh, essentially they treat by default everything as a comment and everything between the code blocks environment as the code and that way you can treat the same document as the uh, later document right so which describes an article right that does something or you can uh, treat it as the executable code so basically you can write an article with the pieces of code and you can always make sure that those pieces of code compile every single time right so you automatically verify the pieces of code in your article so this is how it's usually used um does it make sense Sounds good. Sounds Gucci. Sounds Tamaguchi. So that's basically what it is. And um, I was thinking, this is such a simple idea. Actually, it is a very simple idea. You can implement it, for example, for C or for any language, as a matter of fact. Basically, make this uh, sort of like a code brackets customizable and you would be able to mishmash uh, markdown and javascript or maybe html and c++ and you can have a general single tool that takes all these things uh, configuration on how to treat it and then produce documentation and an executable code that you can compile so my idea is to actually make a more general version of this make a single command line tool that can uh, you, you know where you can configure how you treat these codes and stuff like that and so it can generate two versions of the files right the version that is executable and the version that is basically documentation so that's the idea of today's stream that's the idea of today's stream <clears throat> Mm, Jupyter Notebooks, how is that the same as with Jupyter Notebooks? Jupyter Notebooks is supposed to be like uh, interactive environment. So interactive environment where you interactively reevaluate the blocks and stuff like that. Uh, it has nothing to do with how Jupyter Notebooks works, I don't know. Mm, um, Mm -mm -mm -mm. so all right okay so there is no question i suppose uh let's go ahead and implement that so uh, and the idea is actually super simple right and i think we'll be able to get the idea to implement that idea in a, in a single stream because essentially what we need to do we just need to load the whole file uh, find where the code begins and find where the code ends and uh, then basically comment out everything that is not the code and leave only the pieces of code so uh, yeah so that's basically what we're gonna do uh, sounds good sounds gucci sounds tamaguchi so maybe i'm gonna actually put the uh, link to the literate program and then ask it to the uh, description as well to the description as well so where is my uh, description? Uh, there we go. Uh, literate programming in Haskell. There we go. So here is literate programming in Haskell. Uh, so how should we call this literate programming system? Uh, how should we call it? So we, should, we need to come up with the name for it, with, with a catchy name for this thing. Mm, 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 mm. So... <sighs> I don't know, I don't have a name for it, so maybe something like literate programming in C, but I mean, it's, it, it's not going to be actually specific to C, that's the point, right, so I put it in C for clickbait, right, because people, you know, uh, have a very controversial opinion on C, and they always want a, per a person program in C, just to see, like, you know, um, it feels like to me that people join the C streams for like for the same reason people go to the zoo, right? They think that nobody programs in C, and if you put C, they will just watch. Oh wow, look a person programs in C in 2021! Holy fucking shit! So that's the the only reason why I put C in there. But it has nothing to do with C per se, right? So because uh, it's going to be written in C, but it will work with any language. That's kind of the point, right? So that, that's kind of the point. 
um so um yeah so we need to think about that um mm, 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 mm. so maybe we're gonna just call it lead then uh, right mm, so and let me go ahead and just create this entire thing mm -hmm. So the first thing we probably want to do, right, the first thing we want to do, we want to read the file into the memory and then iterate the file line by line. You know, as a matter of fact, I think I'm going to take my uh, main LHS file. Did I already remove it? Uh, I hope I didn't remove it. So if I go to something like prob uh, and what was that? I think it was lhs here it is so i'm gonna use this specific file as basically the test subject right so we're gonna try to produce um both a later document from it and a haskell document from it so to produce a later document we don't have to change anything as far as i can tell well maybe that's the that's the point uh here you don't have to change anything to pr but produce to produce a haskell document you'd have to uh basically comment everything out like this Right, you have to comment it out like this and then comment it out like this and there we go. Uh, you've got the Husky document. That's exactly why I want to implement this idea because it's so simple. Right, so then you uh, look at the Husky mode and there you go. You can just compile this entire thing. You just basically need to remove uh, all of these things in there. Um, all of these things. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Uh, so... How are we going to accept the uh, command line argument? I think we're going to check arg c uh, greater than, if it's less than two, right? That means you didn't provide the input file. So we're going to do something like sc error, error, um, um, no input file uh, is provided, right? No input file is provided. So, and on top of that, maybe we want to print the usage. Um, the usage is going to be printed to the standard error. Uh, usage file uh, stream. All right. Uh, so uh, f print f uh, stream uh, usage lit and uh, this one is going to be just input. Uh, right. So we don't have any options right now. So but we're going to add them a little bit later. So and after that, I'm going to just exit with this entire thing. So uh, let me also create maybe some sort of like a make file, right? So and uh, this is what we're going to have in here. So this is going to be cc, c flags. Uh, maybe I should use no build for this one. Eh, maybe, maybe I should use no build. Let's actually use no build. Why not? Uh, if we're using everything homemade, so we might as well use no build. Mm -mm -mm -mm. So even though it's not particularly ready for production, uh, I might as well use that thing as well. Mm. Uh, all right. Mm -mm -mm -mm. No build. Don't see. Let's include this entire thing. Right. And define no build implementation. And uh, create an entry point, and let's just call um, CC. So we're gonna have some flags, of course. The uh, output is gonna be just lit, and then we're gonna provide the uh, the input in here. So it's gonna be a single file. So I want this system to be super simple, right? Uh, so define C flags, uh, and it's going to be W all. We're gonna enable all of the warnings. We're gonna enable all of the extra warnings. Uh, then the standard that we're gonna be using, we're gonna be using C11. Uh, we're gonna be pedantic about it. So here's a pedantic and we're gonna enable the uh, debug information in case we wanna debug things. All right, so I'm not gonna accept any arguments right now. And, oh, almost forgot. We, we do need to accept arguments because we need to enable self-rebuilding. So the, uh, the build system is capable of rebuilding itself. So it has a special macro called go rebuild yourself, right? So where you uh, provide the command line arguments, right? Arc C, arc V, and uh, then we can just uh, bootstrap the build system once. Hopefully that will compile. And then when we run the build system, it will just uh, basically go ahead and rebuild itself. 
Uh, okay, so it doesn't really allow me to, like it, it complains that we don't use org v, but this is probably because we need to actually do something like, uh, so input, input file path, org v, org v zero. Actually, it has to be one, right? So because the zeros element is the program name, the first one is the first argument uh, of the of the command line, right? So that's basically what it is. Uh, it is what it is, and it isn't what it isn't. So um, now, uh, if uh, yeah, so the cool thing about this build system, right? The cool thing about this build system is that you can add additional things in here. Hello, uh, right? And you don't have to rebuild the script. Because look, 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 the script will automatically detect that you modified it. It will rebuild itself and it will rerun itself. And then it will run the new version of that script. It's not really script, it's a program, but then you can remove it and it detects that it was modified. It rebuilds itself and so on and so forth. So uh, you don't have to, uh, you know, constantly rebuild when you modify these things, which makes it super convenient, actually. It's almost like using shell scripts and stuff like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? I think it's pretty fucking cool. So uh, we need to read the whole file. We need to read the whole file. So how can we read the whole file? I like I like to memory map my files uh, because it's like three calls, but it's not particularly portable and I'm not sure if it's going to work well on Windows, right? I would like to for this thing to work on windows out of the box so maybe because of that i'll have to go with the you know the classical fseek ftel thingy that basically estimates the size of the file and then allocates enough memory and just reads everything into that file uh, i don't know uh, how do you memory map files in windows does anyone know is it is it too hard to memory map file in windows um Maybe we could write like a cross-platform uh, library for memory mapping stuff uh, on both POSIX and Windows. On POSIX it will just use a map. Uh, on Windows it will use map view of file. Okay, map view of file. Let's actually Google that. Um, so is that how we do that? Is that the official way? Because I know nothing about Windows programming, right? I'm not a KC moratory, right? So I know nothing about this shit. So uh, I know how to memory map files on POSIX though. Maps a view of a file uh, mapping into address space of calling process. So you have to provide the handle. As far as I know, you open a uh, file to get this handle. So then you can provide the desired access, which is basically read-write. It's, it's kind of similar to a map. So file of set high and low. This one is interesting. So file of set high and low. Uh, what's up with that? Um, so high order D word of the file set where the view begins. Hmm. So the low order uh, of set file where view is to begin. I don't understand what's up with this uh, file of sets, but okay. The number of bytes to map. Okay, it's kind of similar. So you need to have a handle, which you probably get by opening a file. Then you need to estimate the size of the file so you can properly map everything. So it's also like at least two calls. Open a file and estimate the size of the file, right? So win, uh, win API get size of file because you will need that size of file to number of bytes to map right uh you'll definitely need that get file size what does it accept does it accept like file path or opened file uh it actually accepts open file so basically it's it's literally pretty much the same as in posix it's just like the functions are different <laughs> right uh it's combined like Oh, it's for, ah, it's for very big files, right? So it's in case the file is so big, it doesn't fit into 64 like bit addressing or something like that. Is that what it is? Also, what is a div word? Is div word 32 uh, or 64? Um, oh, it's a 32. Oh, so it's like a, it's a leftover from the 32 bit times. Okay. So, oh, okay. I see what's going on here. All right. <laughs> That's a funny API. So, I mean, I, I understand that it's sort of like a legacy thing, but yeah, it's just kind of funny. Uh, all right. So maybe at some point we can, uh, we can use that as well. Uh, so <clears throat> it's funny to see a Linux guy come into a Windows API. I've been, I mean, I was programming in bare Windows API when I was in school a long time ago. So 
before I switched to Linux, but I switched to Linux a long time ago, more than 10 years ago. So, but I am kind of familiar with uh, Windows API. I, I tried a lot of different things actually uh, throughout my career. Um, so anyways, so let's actually go ahead and uh, memory map the file and then we'll see if we can abstract the process of memory mapping the file into some sort of API, which will make it easier then later to implement like a Windows backend for that API. Because memory, like reading files through memory mapping in this particular situation is gonna be very, very useful. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What kind of things did you try with Win API? When I tried to do that, I didn't know much uh, about programming at all. So I think things I did were creating windows putting some buttons on windows like making stuff with those buttons i think the best the coolest thing i did is i initialized uh opengl using only win api i think it's called vgl wgl i mean yeah, yeah so i work directly with wgl um maybe uh, i don't remember i don't remember how it's called i think this is kind of this is kind of stuff yeah, yeah. so i was calling to these functions to Try to initialize that. Yeah, I do remember this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a long time ago. Holy shit. It was almost like a different life. My gut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But again, it, it was a long time ago, so I forgot a lot of things. Uh, so, all right. Um, let's uh, open the file, I suppose. Uh, the first thing we want to do, we're going to open the file. So this is going to be open. And uh, we'll need to include these things. Uh, yep, yep, yep. So this already doesn't work on Windows. You just add these three lines and there you go. Windows support goes out of the window. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, so... <laughs> uh, I call open input uh, file path and we're going to be uh, calling it uh, with O or DIN or DON. Yeah, there we go. So when this thing will return a file descriptor for us, right? It returns a file descriptor. If the file descriptor is negative, uh, we do not allow negativity on this positive wipe stream. So we're gonna throw an error about that. Uh, we're gonna report it to Twitch. <laughs> okay. Uh, could not open file as because of as. All right. So input file path, and then I can do something like str error error no and then exit one there we go so we successfully opened a file so the next thing I, I like to do i like to grab the um size of the file i think you have to do uh, f stat right so it's going to be something like this mm, there we go um so we provide the uh, file descriptor then we need to allocate this structure on the stack stat buff maybe even zero initialize it just in case why not uh, struct and then i'm gonna uh, be taking a pointer to that and if this entire thing returns uh, a negative value we yet again throw in an error so f printf std error error could not uh, determine the size of uh, file as because of as and uh, it's going to be all, uh, input file path uh, str error error no there we go and we exit with this cloud uh, with this cloud so after we determine the size of the file as far as i know the size will be located in st size so let's actually save it into a variable called content size right and there we go we have a content size so once we have an opened file and we have the size of the file, we are ready to perform the mapping. So we're going to be calling to memory map. Uh, so I'm going to be including these things. Uh, I think I also need to include um, uni std, uni std, universal uh, std, universally sexually transmitted diseases. That's what it stands for, of course. So. Uh, for the address, we can provide null, which means that we don't care where exactly the operating system is going to place the file. I literally don't give a shit. Uh, the length is how much we want to map, and we want to map content uh, size in this case. So protection, as far as I know, we only care about reading, right? We don't need writing, we don't need anything else. So I can say prot read and nothing else. Uh, 
Flags, if I remember correctly, in our case, we need map private. So we're going to create a private copy on write mapping. Updates to the mapping are not visible to other processes, mapping the same file, and so on and so forth. We just want to read the contents of the file and nothing else. So maybe I'm going to say something like map uh, private, and then we provide the file descriptor, uh, and then we provide the offset, and in that case, offset is going to be zero. We don't care. So after that, uh, we get the content data, right? In our case, it would be, um, you know, it would be reasonable to reinterpret this data to character right away, right? Because we only care about the character data, right? And if this entire thing returns uh, a null, right? If it returns a null, well, uh, we couldn't uh, we couldn't do anything. So we got a raid from Gamoza. Thank you, thank you so much uh, for the raid, Gamoza. I hope your stream went well. Uh, is this Rust? Yes, it is Rust. Uh, so, is this yeah. Rust? Yes. yes, it is in fact a Rust, as you can see. It is very, very safe. Thank you so much for the raid and thank you so much for the uh, for 16 months of tier 1 subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So what we're trying to do, we're just trying to memory map a file. So <laughs> nothing, nothing particularly special, right? So we're just trying to memory map a file and grab the whole content of that file so we can just parse that file without any problems. But on top of that, I'm trying to design it so then I can take this entire process of memory mapping the file and factor it out into something more cross across platform that could be implemented uh, with win API calls and stuff like that. So I'm not really doing anything special. And I'm for sure not using this shady F open, F read, F write, whatever the fuck it is people, like POSIX people want me to use. Uh, so I'm definitely not using that. So I'd rather just like, you know, ask operating system for, for a proper API to read files. Um, so yeah. <clears throat> Uh, are you memory out just for memory efficiency? I, it's just more convenient to work it that way, in my opinion. <laughs> right? It's just like it's it's three function calls, and you got the whole file. So uh, that's it. So it's just, it's just that simple. You don't have to organize loops or anything like that or something. Just yeah, memory map that shit and just give me the ah content. So that's that's why I'm doing that. It's 2021. Can we just like have a function that just uh, where I can say give me the file and just fucking gives me the file? I don't know. I won't have that. So anyway, um, here's the content. If this entire thing fails, right, uh, could not uh, memory map uh, file s because of s. Okay, so and um, yeah, the file is going to be input file path. And the reason is str error, error no, or something like that. There we go. So it's going to be exit to one. Uh, there we go. There we go. So we've got that shit going for us, which is cool. Um, so now we can try to print the content of this thing. So can I just use F write to quickly print it? I suppose. I think that's the easiest way to do that. Just to test things out. Content data, content, content size. Um, so to be fair, yeah, so the content size is going to be the size of a single element. That means here I have to provide one. And I'm going to be printing that to std out. There we go. So std out. And I don't really care about the return of this function because I call this function just to test things out. Nothing particularly special. So let's try to rebuild the entire thing. There we go. Uh, so what do we have in here? str error. So I think I need to do the string. Do we have anything else? Error no. Uh, error no. There we go. There we go. Everything seems to be compiling. So if I try to call my program, so this is going to be lit, uh, I forgot a new line yet again. You see, C doesn't have a borrow checker and borrow checker would have prevented this kind of problem. So unfortunately, it's a very unsafe language. So you have to fix this kind of stuff manually. So uh, let's go ahead and put a new line in here and let's try to recompile the entire thing. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> So, uh, yep, yep, yep. So no input file. So if I try to provide LHS, uh, there we go. So we read the whole, uh, the content, uh, the whole content of the file. That's basically it. Uh, but I forgot one small thing. Uh, one small thing. I think I forgot to unmap the file. But to be fair, when you exit the process, right, it will automatically close and unmap all of the things so there's no reason for you to worry about that but i'm gonna do that just to keep things clean right so to unmap this thing we're gonna do a uh, mon map i think that's how it's called that's how you unmap shit right there we go 
and here we have to provide the content data right the content data and the content size there we go content size it can fail but to be fair when we are about to exit right and the unmapping fails do we really give a shit if it fails or not like seriously who gives a shit if it failed? We're about to fucking die. Right, so, and uh, the same with close, right? I can close it, it can fail, but do I give a shit? Uh, I'm about to fucking die, so, I don't know, maybe not. Um, so, I just want to put it in there. Uh, so, let's try to rebuild the entire thing, uh, and then rerun it. You know what? I think I need to add a sub command for my no build system, right? So um, in this sub command is going to be basically run. Uh, on top of rebuilding everything, it will also try to rerun the thing. So for those who doesn't know, I'm using my custom build system, <laughs> which is called no build, and it's literally a C program. Yes, I'm building a C program with a C program. Yes. So here is the idea. <laughs> So, for, for, for new people who may be like not familiar with what, what the fuck I'm doing, uh, I'm using this thing. I developed it a long time ago, uh, right, and uh, you can find it in here. So, the idea is the following, that uh, to build a C, um, C program, you don't need anything but a C compiler. Uh, no make, no C make, no shell, no CMD, no anything. Like, you have a C program and you have a C compiler. You should be able to build the whole C project with just a C compiler. That's the idea. So, and what you do, uh, you bootstrap your build system. So the bootstrap of the build system has to be as simple as just compiling no build.c into executable. Nothing else has to be provided. And the rest of the bootstrapping and heavy lifting has to be done within this program. If it needs several stages, it will compile several stages that will bootstrap itself and st stuff like that. But you bootstrap like one little thing and everything is just done for you. So that's the idea of no build. So uh, there is a couple of caveats to that. Of course, there's disadvantages. I document it as much as I could. Uh, you can read through all of that, but that's basically the idea. So, and by the way, th this thing is capable of rebuilding itself, right? So it has a special macro that detects that you modify the source code, and if you modify the source code, it will go and rebuild itself. Uh, seriously. So if I do something like, uh, did it rebuild itself, right? So, and I just call no build without rebuilding this program, and it will, it basically detect it that uh, I modified the source code, it renamed itself to uh, nobuild.old, recompiled itself and rerun itself and now it is running a new version so you don't have to ever like rebuild it. It can detect that uh, you know you modified the source code. Then you can remove that and you can treat it like a, just a script. So it's a script that rebuilds itself. Um, so it's pretty convenient. And by the way, here's a bonus. It works on POSIX and Windows. So uh, on Windows, we are literally using WinAPI. So we basically detect whether you're building on Windows or something like that. And if you're on Windows, we're using Windows specific uh, function calls and so on and so forth. So the, the entire build system is around like thousand lines of code, right? So this is the entire build system works on POSIX and Windows uh, using WinAPI and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> so that's basically it actually that's basically oh there we go so we have a function is path one modified after path two just to detect that something modified and as you can see on windows we're using functions like get file time and so on and so forth and uh, on POSIX we're using things like stat and we're comparing the times so basically we distinguish between different environments and use different things trying to be cross-platform and shit so that's basically it that's basically what we're doing here if anyone is interested so uh what i wanted to do here so now i can add uh sub commands right so if argc is greater than one right so that means uh, you provided a sub command so the sub command is probably located somewhere here we're gonna do strcmp uh and if it's equal to run on top of just recompiling the entire thing we're gonna go ahead and run that thing so we might as well uh, run it uh, on the test file that we have. This is going to be main LHS. Right, if you provided an unknown subcommand, right, we're going to panic saying something like uh, unknown subcommand as 
and uh, we're gonna put argv1 zulu in here there we go so that's basically what we can have in here so all of these macros they come from the no build itself right so it's specifically designed to like create such build recipes there we go and then i can do run and it automatically runs it right so basically when i do no build run it will compile everything and then run the uh, the main program in here and the main program just printed the content of the file uh so do cmd capture std out of the command means what you mean by capture so what do you mean capture the output so what is your use case what do you want <laughs> right do you want to redirect it somewhere or something so when you do command it just forks the process and runs a child process that's what it does so um if you want to redirect a standard output, we have a special func functionality called chains. You can basically redirect the output to a, of a command to a different file. Maybe I want to take a decision based on the output. So that's a good choice, right? So uh, we plan to implement that, but it's not implemented yet. Right. So at some point, uh, we'll have uh, an opportunity, we'll have a capability to actually save it to some sort of a buffer, but not right now. So this build tool is not finished yet. So keep that in mind. Uh, but if you want to, like right now, I suppose you can basically re redirect it to a file and then read from that file as a workaround. But uh, in the future, you'll be able to actually read it directly into, uh, write it directly into memory. Um, so there we go. Uh, all right, so what I was doing, um, yeah, on top of that, I wanted to extract this entire thing to a more, uh, how to say that, more cross-platform interface, all right, so then we can implement it also for Windows. So, you know what I'd like to do? I would like to introduce like a structure, some sort of a structure called mapped file, right, and the mapped file is going to contain basically... Yeah, I think it will contain the opened file descriptor, the uh, the content size and the content data, right? So uh, first, the most important thing is going to be the content data. I'm maybe going to actually point it as a pointer to void because you never know what, what's in there, right? So let's not make any assumptions on what's, what's the content of the file. And uh, then we're going to have a content size. So, and then we're going to have a platform dependent part of the structure, right? So for, for instance, on POSIX, it's going to be that, right? So, and if you are on Windows, Windows, not Windows, um, it's going to be something like handle, I suppose, right? So, yeah, so open handle, uh, right? So something like this. Uh, but again, we're not implementing it right now. So I'm just like, you know, I'm making you know, theorizing how it's going to look like. For now, it's going to be just uh, like this FD. Uh, so the next thing I want to have, I want to have a function that basically maps the file, right? So you would provide a path to the file, so file path. And um, so it could return mapped file, but I think it would be better if it would accept the mapped file structure as a pointer, right? So it's going to be MF. So, and then it is going to return, I suppose, Boolean, indicating uh, whether there was an error or whether there was no error, right? And uh, we're going to implement this thing in here. So, and another th uh, thing we're going to have in here is a function that unmaps the file. Uh, it accepts a mapped file and basically unmaps the file. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. What's the difference between implementation of detecting file changes? We don't have a detecting file changes and using something like... Uh, I notify is needed when uh, you want to detect changes in real time. But uh, what if you want to detect changes between executions of the program? So... The question implies that you don't know what is I notify, and that means I have to explain you what is I notify now. Uh, okay, so I notify basically gives you a stream of events, right? Uh, when you start using I notify, you basically tell the system, okay, here is the file. Observe 
what are the events on that file and also listen for these specific events like modified something modified something and you constantly get the stream of events right you constantly get the stream of events and you keep getting the stream of events as long as your program is running right once your program is not running you don't receive these events i notify is using is used for real time file modification detections when your program is running now look uh, when i run my build tool it runs and then it exits that's it so we can't receive the stream of events from inotify right but we need to detect that the source code of this thing was modified between the runs of the program. I know I don't know much about iNotify. I used it only a couple of times, but I think iNotify cannot do these kind of things, right? It cannot uh, basically um, ask the system what kind of events happened from that time when it was last run so I can catch up or something like that. I don't think it, it's capable of doing that. And if it was capable of doing that, means that means operating system need to have some sort of a buffer to do that and so on and so forth. Right. So the way we detect is just we compare the time, the last time modification of the source code and the last time modification of the binary. And if the binary is older than the source code, that means the source code was modified and we rebuild it. Does it answer your question? Okay. Uh, so that's how we do that. And that's the difference between that and I notify. And I think, I believe, I'm not 100% sure, I'm not expert on notify, but I notify is not applicable to this specific case because of how I notify works. Again, if you are a I notify an expert, please tell me that I'm wrong. But if I'm wrong, that means there is some sort of a buffer that operating system like, keeps track of all of the events and you can query all of the events from a specific time, of, uh, time but it doesn't lo really look feasible. Right, so I don't think it's, it's capable of doing this kind of thing. So anyway, so uh, let's do this kind of thing. Just to do boolean .h. Mm -mm -mm. All right, so um, now um, I want to actually take all of these function calls, all of that mess, and tuck it under these two functions calls. Uh, so how are we going to do that? Um, I suppose uh, I'm going to just copy paste this entire shit uh, and just and uh, save it in here. Uh, all right. <clears throat> so when I open the file, I'm going to be actually opening the file in here. <clears throat> mm, I have an idea, actually. I have an idea. So what if your file is already mapped and you're trying to call this function the second time? Right, so you have mapped file, you allocate the structure on the stack. Then you say map a file, mf and uh, something like input txt and if it didn't uh, map you basically uh, panic or something if it mapped everything's okay but what if you try to do it the second time right so what should we do in this particular case we probably need to detect that you already mapped the file and not map it or we can basically first try to unmap the file right uh, and map the file so and here is the function so we're trying to unmap the file uh, and um, now we know that it's not mapped and we can remap it again. Here's the interesting thing. Uh, how do we know that a file was unmapped or mapped? Well, uh, we can check if the content data is not equal to null. That means, that means the file is mapped to something and we want to close the file descriptor we want to close the file descriptor and we want to unmap. Actually, we want to first unmap that content and uh, with this data uh, like this and then close the file descriptor. And after that, uh, we want to maybe zero initialize everything. So it's going to be mem set mf uh, zero size of uh, mf. 
there we go so this entire thing basically if something is mapped it will unmap it and zero initialize everything and the first thing we do when you try to map the file twice well we unmap it that will automatically zero initialize everything for you and then we try to remap it again i think it makes sense all right so in this particular case maybe uh we can simply yeah we can simply return something um mm -hmm. I'm thinking, what if, can, do we really need to check for this kind of shit? What if I unmap null? Is that something bad? Uh, if I try to unmap null or close, if you try to close zero, it's probably definitely going to be bad. <laughs> so. So I will need to think about this kind of stuff. We'll need to think about this kind of stuff. But ideally, ideally, I want the system to work like this. Right? Uh, I want to do something like map uh, mapped file, right? So it's going to be a map. I zero initialize. If uh, I couldn't map this specific file, which is basically input file path, uh, I will say f printf std error error could not uh, read file s because of that reason. So then I can uh, say input file path, str error, uh, error no, there we go. And then I can exit with one, there we go. So then um, I can take the contents provided in here, I can print it. Um, and then I can unmap the file. So it's gonna be unmap file uh, pointer to MF and it will zero initialize everything. So, and then uh, we could try to implement this interface for both um, Windows and Linux or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I need to think about how to do that a little bit better. So, but I think I want to make another uh, break and then a cup of tea. Right. So once I have a cup of tea, maybe I'll have more, uh, you know, motivation to, to think about this problem. So let's go ahead and make a small break. Right. So here's the problem. Um, I'm trying to follow zero initialization rule, meaning that uh, if I have a structure and I zero initialize the whole structure, uh, I want this to be a valid structure. And if I zero initialize a map file, what I would it, uh, what I would expect it to be, I would expect it to be an empty unmapped file. So, and an empty un unmapped file means that this is a null pointer, this is zero, and here's the thing: the file descriptor could be zero. So, zero NFD does not indicate that uh, the file is not present. Right, but I still want to follow zero initialization rule because it makes it uh, makes initialization of like several of such things super easy. I can just mem set like an array of mapped files to zero, and uh, that will correctly initialize them. So um, and messing with like minus one and stuff like that is extremely annoying. So I think I'm going to introduce additional field uh, which is going to be boolean mapped, and this is the. Uh, flag that is going to indicate whether the entire file is mapped or not. Um, but we, we can also have a weird situation where, uh, that... Mm, oh, this one is very annoying. This one is extremely annoying because I had... It's not going to actually help anything. It is really not going to help anything. Okay, so uh, let's actually do a, like a different thing in here, right? So uh, if we have NFD, right? So here is NFD and it's initially my, minus one, uh, right? And if uh, this entire thing fails, right? It will be automatically negative value. It will be automatically negative value. <sighs> mm. 
So ideally, I'm, I didn't even know how to make it better. So the the whole idea that FD uh, can be zero and zero is a valid file descriptor actually breaks a lot of logic. That is that would be very very convenient, and it just like uh, it annoys me to no end. <laughs> So um, anyway, so this entire thing is not null, right? If this entire thing is not null, right, we want to uh, basically unmap it, right? And after that, I suppose we want to set this entire stuff to null, right? And this entire thing to uh, zero. So and if FD was uh, actually allowed to be zero and zero was an indication that like you don't have uh, like you don't have a file in here right if it's not zero you would close it and then you would assign fd to zero and then you would be able to take these three lines and compress all of these three lines into mem set and that would be actually nice and clean but unfortunately fd could be zero and zero could be a, a, a valid file descriptor so we have to do minus one but that breaks an idea of zero initialization rule where i want this structure to be like zero initialized and to be a valid unmapped file so it just breaks the whole logic and it's just so goddamn annoying right so um i don't know i don't know what to do so and then um and what's funny is that uh, you can introduce this flag mapped, but that flag is only needed for Linux, right? Because on Windows, right, uh, as we already saw, you have a handle, right? And WinAPI handle is just basically a pointer. And a pointer, if, if I understand correctly, handle is a pointer, right? Uh, what's the definition of handle? Uh, where can I see the type def for the handle? Um, can I see the type there for the handle? I suppose it is uh, like a nullable thing. Uh, right, hopefully. It, it is pvoid. Like, it's literally pvoid. That means it could be nullable. So, on Windows, you don't need this kind of thing. So, um, it's just like, yeah, it's just so annoying. Uh, FD opened uh, or something maybe like yeah fd open so that's basically what you need in here as an indication that uh yeah or maybe if you had option types right so you would put like it inside of an option if you don't want to know what i'm talking about postix is kind of weird right um postix is kind of weird invalid handle might be minus one uh, invalid handle but why is it a pointer then handle is not a pointer Well, well, I know nothing about WinAPI, so maybe you're right. But uh, I'm looking at what? Uh, MSDN, Microsoft.com. Mm. Is declared winning two. Well, maybe, maybe you're right, maybe not, I don't know. Handle is not a point. <laughs> Who knows? Anything is possible in a Windows world, right? It is a pointer. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, but, but the confidence, confidence, that's what's important in the internet discussion. It doesn't matter what's written in the documentation. What's important is just saying that out loud with the confidence, and that way you don't need any documentation, right? So it is not a pointer right we have to say that confidently mm. it declared as a point but that doesn't point oh okay so basically it's a value wrapped into void star and um, it's actually quite common uh, in old code i suppose anyway so we can have something like this in here right um just a second mm look at memory in debugger <laughs> just give me a second i'm gonna start up visual studio just just a second 
Okay, um, so... <laughs> I wanna cry. I literally wanna cry when I read the chat. It's just like... <sighs> Maybe I should not just read the chat. It's like, yeah, sure. Just, just give me a second, I'm gonna look in the debugger. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay, so let's introduce the Slack and it's gonna be like a platform dependent thing, right? Um, so, essentially, Mm, um, you have that, and then we unmap the entire thing, and then this is FD open. Uh, if thing is FD open, we close the FD, and that's it. And then I can do mem set mf zero size of uh, mf. So there we go. So after that, um, right, I unmap the file uh, mf, right, and then what we do mfd, I assign fd in here, and after this thing uh, succeeded, I will say fd open uh, true, and there we go, that's cool. So furthermore, I think it would be nice to have something like go to error, right? So the classical, look chat, do we have anyone who's left from Gamoza raid? I'm using go to. I'm, yes, I'm using go to. I'm programming in a very unsafe language uh, called C without like a boundary checks or borrow checker or anything like that. And on top of that, I'm using go to. I mean, probably majority of people already left, but still. Uh, so yeah, just, just, just to let you know, I want to emphasize on that. Um, okay, so what do we have in here? If this thing is failed, so here's go to error. Uh, then we are getting the content size, All right? So this one is going to be mf content size and then mf content data. And if the mf motherfucking content data, motherfucking content size, motherfucking file descriptor. <laughs> I really like this name actually. This is such a good name. <laughs> the fucking content date. <laughs> this is so good. Love it. Um, ooh. So, uh, yeah, so we don't need that. Uh, and this one is going to be a uh, go to error. All right. So, and in here, right, um, we return true when uh, it is successful. So in case of an error, uh, the only thing we're doing, we're just unmapping the thing and mapping it back uh, and then returning false. So you see the idea here, it's basically defer, right? I'm doing a defer um, or it's it's like array AI. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there we go. So it's like array AI. It's like implementation of a drop interface, like, you know, in Rust, uh, right? You, you have a drop Treat, trait, not not interface, I'm sorry. Uh, right, you have a drop, which is a basically destructor, and that's basically the code that will be executed when you exit the scope or something. That's what we're trying to emulate. That's what we're doing. Uh, right, so the, where is the drop trait? Um, here it is. Here's, here's the drop. That's what we're emulating. Mm -hmm. Get rid of all the function, use only go to, but it's not particularly convenient. Um, it's, it's actually kind of interesting. You can probably do that, but then you would have to maintain this stack yourself, right? It's actually a pretty cool idea. Just a second, how would you implement that? So um, essentially, well, you're forced to have main uh, because that's the entry point. Uh, but then within the main, you can have uh, different functions, like for example, print function, right? Um, Essentially, what you'll have to do, you'll have to have some sort of a global stack, right? And a global stack, you're going to have frames, right? So this is going to be something like frame. And uh, I would say that it's a union, right? Because I want to be able to reinterpret that union in different ways. I want to be able to reinterpret it as a pointer, right? So it's kind of difficult because you also need to store a return location and arguments right so we're going to have a frame a stack uh, some sort of a stack capacity uh and is it even possible to so does label have any type in c can i sort of take a pointer to the label and store that thing in a frame of a stack so i can go to to that thing later 
can you go to to an address somehow that's actually a very interesting thing if it I will allow that it would be actually possible to like have that somehow uh, so see address of uh, label it's actually pretty cool it's possible to store the address yeah yeah, yeah. so th that's the point uh, can you store the address and then jump to that address later maybe you can emulate that with the long jumps does not allow this feature, however, the GNU compiler includes a non-standard exception for doing this, as described this article. So they have added a special operator, uh, ampersand percent that reports the address of the label as void star. Uh, in other words, instead of, uh, okay, that's, so in, in GCC, it would be possible, right? And then you'll be able to actually jump there. So you can save address of go to in GCC and jump back so you can emulate procedures right and when you're about to call a procedure you'll have to push the return well you also need to be able to push the return address of the current executing instruction so there should be a way to get the current execution instruction so uh, yeah but I don't know. Maybe you can do it as an offset from something, if you know the line number. Uh, but yeah, I think in in a, in a vanilla C, it's not particularly possible. But yeah, we're getting close. We're getting close. But maybe it should be possible in a standard C with like long jumps or something. Um, anyways, so we're gonna have that. We then go to two errors, and everything seems to be Gucci. Everything seems to be Tamaguchi. All right, so, and if I try to rerun the entire thing, so uh, open input, so this is going to be file path. Uh, what else do we have in here? So it's a motherfucking file descriptor, then motherfucking file descriptor up yet again, right? Uh, and then motherfucking content size, and then motherfucking file descriptor, and that is basically it. There we go. So I think we did everything. So we have a sort of like a cross-platform way of um you know of doing all that so the only thing that we lack is an ability to report errors that have happened uh, in this particular layer but um uh, we could just implement something i don't know report the last error or whatnot uh so yeah so that's how we map the files that's pretty cool so it took us one and a half of an hour to map a file on a stream i'm super happy and it seems to be working it seems to be it's working so uh to be fair the input file is not correct so the input file is not correct we have to actually do it like this uh there we go so now it is in fact correct so and uh lit haskell alliterate haskell there we go uh, okay so the next thing we need to do with this uh file we need to iterate it uh line by line all right to do that uh we are going to use this string uh string view library right i'm going to be using string view library that you can find in here if you're interested and i'm going to also put that in the description uh for people who's watching me on youtube so string view library there we go and also we were also using no build build system so and i think it would make sense to actually put this thing in the description as well no build build system there we go so uh let's go where is uh sv so let's go in here and let's grab the raw version of the string view All right so we're going to do w get and uh i'm going to include the string view in here so as far as i know uh yeah gotcha guys uh it's a stb style library that means i need to first include implementations right so it's gonna be sv implementations and there we go so the string of view library it has a function sv from parts so and this function accepts the data and the count right that's what it accepts so and it basically builds the string view from these two things and we already have the data and the size right uh, you can get them from the motherfucking content size and the content data uh so it's gonna be content data and then uh motherfucking content size and there we go we've got the content um all right so and then we can iterate line by line 
uh, we implemented a mapped file API, uh, which stands for MF. So <laughs> now it's MF content data, MF content size, and so on and so forth. Uh, so that's what we have in here, content count. Uh, right, so let's also chop off a line. Right, so it's gonna be a SV chop by delimiter, uh, the content, and the delimiter in this case is gonna be a new line. Right, and we can try to print that line just to see if it actually, you know, works. So it's gonna be SVFMT. Uh, might as well wrap it in parentheses, just a proof that we're actually handling that stuff properly. SVARG line, there we go. And let's try to run this entire thing. And uh, yeah, there we go. So as you can see, we're handling everything properly. So that means we're actually splitting the content of the file by lines. That is perfect. That is absolutely perfect. Uh, another interesting thing. Now, basically, that is it, believe it or not. So we need to introduce two modes uh, of, um, of the system. The mode when we are handling the comments and the mode when we are handling the code, right? So um, we need to introduce some sort of like a boolean. Um, so comments, maybe maybe basically doc, right? So and we are initially in the, I don't know, maybe code mode. Let's call it code mode because by default it's not going to be in code mode. So and depending on the mode, we're going to be um, handling lines differently, right? If you are in a code mode, right? If you are in a code mode, uh, I think you simply uh, print the lines as they are, right? So you do SFFMT, then SVARG, and you just print that line. That is it. You don't have to do anything unless, unless you encounter um, and so you are in the code mode so you take each individual line and you treat it as the code and you just print it as it is then you encounter uh, end code like like this uh, and that means you have to treat it as the comment and you have to switch to a different uh to a different mode mm -hmm. um all right hmm to be fair Maybe the mode switching has to happen like before you print anything. Yeah. So essentially, if you are in a code mode and mm -mm -mm -mm, and the line, so we might as well maybe even, no, we don't have to do that. Maybe we do um, SV equal SV trim line and it has to be equal to code end right so this is the code end so if something like this has happened you switch to uh, code mode false you're not in a code mode anymore if you're not in a code mode you're in a comment mode and the line uh, is equal to the begin right it is equal to the begin uh huh. Uh, we're gonna be switching to the code mode like this. So this is gonna be true. Okay. Uh, then, depending on whether we are in a code mode, more. If we are in a code mode, we're just printing that line back. So SVFMT, SVFMT. We're just printing this entire thing back. Uh, so. <clears throat> and SV arg, um, so it's going to be line, right? And if you're not in a code mode, we'll have to pr uh, like prefix it with a comment, right? So it's going to be SV FMT new line SV arg. Believe it or not, that is it. <laughs> this is the entire core functionality of the program. <laughs> That's how simple the entire idea is. We spend more time coming up with like a mapped file API, but the core idea behind this literate programming in Haskell, like this thing, is just freaking this. So <laughs> that's literally it. <laughs> it's embarrassingly simple. 
It is freaking embarrassingly simple. Okay, so if I try to do run, uh, it does not compile. Let's actually go ahead and compile everything first. So it has to be SV like this, and this one also has to be SV. Uh, boom. And do we have anything else? So it complains about something. Yeah, it has to be just print F, and there we go. So yeah, there we go. Um, and I think, yeah, we did a fucking wacky and even oopsie doopsie. Okay. So when you encounter code, oh, okay. So there is a little bit of like a wonky logic in here. Um, so if you are not in a code mode, but you encounter the begin, you encounter the begin, you still uh, treat it as no code and you still need to comment it out, but uh, you need to switch to the code mode, right? So something like this. Uh, now you're in a code mode. But if you are in a code mode and you encounter end line, you have to comment it out. So it's a little bit weird, uh, but it is what it is. So uh, just a second. So can I grab this entire thing? Right, if, uh, if this thing is end line, that means I wanna print it as commented out. Otherwise, don't comment it out. <laughs> yeah, uh, the, the idea is still relatively simple, right? It's just like kind of a weird logic, but it is what it is. Uh, there we go, right. And something happened at the end, which I don't necessarily understand. Oh, and yeah, so you have to switch to uh, not code mode. There we go. There we go. So the original thing looked like this, right? The original thing looked like this. And the transform things looked like this, uh, which is like a proper Haskell code. Right, it is a proper Haskell code. So we can now try to um, write something more interesting. So for instance, let's actually ditch um, Haskell and let's write something like hello world in uh, C. This is how you write the famous hello world program in uh, C, right? And this one is going to be something like lit, right? Uh, maybe technically it could be actually tech, right? So let's call it hello tech. Uh, yep, yep, yep. So, and let's just write it. So we'll have to include stdio, uh, right? And uh, I don't know why it tries to indent it like that, but it is what it is. Uh, then I'm gonna do print f, uh, hello, um, um, so. <laughs> Uh, okay, so it took a little bit of time for Emacs to realize it's a verbatim uh, environment and it finally switched to, to this thing. So it's going to be hello world and then we have to return with zero. No indentation, no anything. So let's just remove this entire stuff. One, two, and this is a one, two. There we go. So here is the code and uh, we're ready to do this kind of stuff. And I'm going to switch the comment style to uh, something else. Mm, something like maybe um, like this. Right. And uh, the input that we're going to run, the input that we're going to run is going to be hello tech. Right. So this is the hello tech thing. And if I try to run this entire thing, as you can see, uh, it now generated the C code, right? So that means I can just call uh, lit hello tech and produce hello C, right? And then if you take a look at hello C, it's, it's a program that you can simply compile. So that's the entire idea of, the, uh, of this, uh, you know, literate system. Uh, and uh, I want to test how this kind of stuff would work. Um, so it would be nice to maybe uh, have a separate environment where we can test this entire thing. So I'm going to remove the C program, right? I'm going to remove the C program and I'm going to create a hello folder. Inside of the hello folder, I'm going to put the hello tech and uh, lit executable, right? And uh, basically the idea is going to be you write uh, this as your main uh, program, right? You have, um, you know, the... 
um, the documentation and the code in the same place, right? So documentation and the code in the same place. And you have some sort of like a make like or build system, right? So, and what you're trying to build, you're trying to build several targets, right? So this is going to be for you all. And the first target is essentially a hello program and hello PDF. So you're trying to build these two things. So you have uh, a single file and you want to generate executable and PDF from a single file. That's the point, right? So uh, let's try to generate a PDF file. So to generate a PDF file, you need hello tech. And um, so you produce hello tech uh, well, you basically take hello tech and just do later hello uh, tech and that is it. So, so then I can just do uh, make uh, hello PDF, please make hello PDF and that generated a PDF for me and if I open this entire thing, here it is. So here is the hello world in C. Cool. So then in make file, right, uh, I want to produce hello executable. I can only produce it from hello.c. So once I have hello.c, I'm going to call a C compiler and I'm going to just create that thing. Uh, so maybe I'm going to enable, uh, you know, different uh, things uh, like this, right? Um, do I need to enable different standards? Maybe I can enable std11 and be pedantic about it. Maybe I'm, I'm going to also include debug information, you know, the usual stuff. And uh, there we go. So, but we don't have a hello C program. Well, you can create hello C from hello tech, the same one uh, that you used to create PDF, uh, and call lit hello tech and save this entire thing to hello C. There we go. So we have a system that constantly uh, rebuilds the executable and PDF from a single source code, right? So from a single source code. Uh, so let's give it a try. I'm going to try to rebuild everything from here and uh, something doesn't work because it's text, right? So where's the text? I don't have a text. Rebuild everything. Okay, so it rebuilt everything. I have a hello world system, right? Which printed hello world in here, right? And I have uh, the PDF file. So there we go. I have a, the, the PDF file. So, yep, that's the thing. Hmm. So now we can try to write some sort of article that is also an executable program, right? So can we try to do that? So what should we write an article about? What should we write an article about? We can write an article about bubble sort in C. Uh, all right, so bubble sort uh, in C. Uh, so uh, bubble sort is the simplest uh, is probably uh, the first sorting algorithm uh, everyone is introduced to. Uh, okay, let's first include the necessary uh, necessary header files, right? Necessary header files, and in here I'm gonna literally just go uh, a code, and uh, right now I suppose we only need like stdio and stdlib, and that is it, right? So here are the files, and as we need more, we're gonna be including more things in here. Um, uh, as uh, as we need more, we're gonna do the whole thing. Um, <clears throat> Mm, okay, so the uh, the main operation of bubble sort is swapping two values, um, um, swapping two values, and let's do something like code, right? And here we're gonna do int swap um, something like int x int uh, y. Uh, right, so I wish it was a little bit less wonky, but it is what it is. Maybe if you had an editor with the support for this kind of thing, it would be a little bit easier to work with. Right, uh, then uh, we're going to do something like x, y, and then uh, y is going to be equal to x. And we don't really need to return anything here. Um, okay, so there we go. Uh, maybe... Um, so maybe we can do something like here is the entry point, right? Here's the entry point and we can actually re rework this entire thing a little bit later, right? 
so it's gonna be uh, oh my god <laughs> emacs doesn't make it easier for me one two three four return zero uh there we go so if i try to recompile the entire thing it seems to be recompiling so here is the c code that got generated from the documentation and uh the pdf file the pdf file uh looks like this so maybe i can actually open uh, it like this. Okay, so bubble sword is probably the first algorithm. So the main operation and blah blah blah. So that's basically the point of literate programming in Haskell. Right. So this is how Haskell like asks you to do this kind of stuff. Um, which is okay, I suppose. It's a very interesting concept. You can write an article or prepare maybe some sort of a talk that also simultaneously checks that um you know all of the code snippets there compile properly and believe it or not i already used this kind of technique for different talks that i gave so i actually prepared the talk for um you know iomanet in haskell and i prepared the slides um uh, using later and stuff like that and i actually wrote all of the slides in literate haskell Right, so these are all of the slides. They're written in literate Haskell, and all of the snippets and all of the code in here is ensured to be compilable, right? So I have a lot of different shit in here. So I think there is even a PDF in here. Can I open? I think there is no PDF. Let's actually clone it. Um, so yeah, I did this kind of shit like long time ago, actually. Uh, so I never gave that talk. Um, so, and instead, I made a video about Ayomanet. Um, that's a lot of shit, by the way. <laughs> so I think it just populates the index. It's needed for the, the, uh, the, the color stuff, right? For the, uh, you know, for the syntax highlighting. Okay, so, and what this thing did, uh, I suppose it just compiled everything. So there is an O file and uh, everything. So, and also there should be a PDF file. Do we have a PDF file? There we go, we, we do have a PDF file. And uh, here are the slides, right? 2008, it was actually a long time ago, but yeah. So, <laughs> so and here is me promoting myself and my Haskell rank series. And I explain uh, what is this kind of stuff. And uh, this code is actually constantly checked to be compilable, right? So this entire code is constantly checked to be compilable uh, as I modify it. So all of these things is ensured to be compatible, <laughs> sort. <laughs> I think I already made that thing. So yeah, I, um, you, you can probably find this thing in here if you're interested in it. So I never actually gave that talk. Um, because reasons um i don't know so i sort of like agreed to give that talk but then everything got cancelled and uh, i made a youtube video instead <laughs> so literally my iomanet video on my main channel is basically this talk uh and i made that video because the the talk was cancelled right so and i never gave it so i decided i'll just make a video out of that why not uh so yeah studying uh iomanet um so that, that's that's basically this talk, uh, essentially. Uh, you can find it in here if you are in fact interested. So I'm gonna actually put all of that stuff in the description. Uh, Io Monat uh, video. Um, okay. Slides for the Io Monat talk, right? And I'm gonna put all of that here as well. So, and I use the same technique. I use the same technique to prepare this kind of slides. So what I'm trying to do now, I'm trying to take that technique and make it more general because I believe like it doesn't have to be specifically a Haskell thing because the whole process of taking this tech file and converting it to a source code that is compilable by some sort of a compiler is actually pretty straightforward. It's not that hard. You just like command out everything that is not a code and there you go. It, you see, th that's it. So, 
that's how you can ensure that all of that stuff is compilable. We wouldn't even have to introduce, I think, the entry point, right? Because we can only compile the um, the translation unit, right? So if right now I try to do something like this, uh, you see there's undefined reference to main, but then I can do something like make file and I could try to simply do minus c so i'm compiling only the uh, the translation unit right so that's what i'm doing uh and yeah so it ensures that i didn't make any mistakes in here so if i go to semicolon right um the fact that i still have these comments in here right i still have these comments in here makes it super easy for me to find this thing in here and fix it it's still not particularly convenient it would be kind of nice to sort of like have a system that redirects back into into this file sort of like a source maps or whatnot but yeah it is what it is um <clears throat> it is what it is the main operation of bubble sword is swapping two values uh, so the easiest easiest way to remember how to implement it is um, when you uh, assign something to uh, the t uh, variable, right? How do you, do I do like a verbatim? but uh in line one i think it's something like verb and then i yeah this is how we do that so i can actually provide any sort of symbol in here right and it will just use that as a matching symbol for this thing if i remember correctly right so this is how i can do this kind of stuff if you assign something to the uh to the variable c uh like um verb um int t equal x you are saving that thing you're saving that thing so uh on the next line you can override it uh override it uh verb uh x equal not y so you see uh you can actually start with whatever variable you want. You have two variables, x and y, and you want to swap them. So obviously you're going to have like a temporary variable that involves, uh, like that is involved in the process. So you can assign whatever uh, you want to this variable. Once you assign it, you know that you saved it. So now you can override it and be sure that you never lose it because you already saved it. Right, and then since you already assigned this thing, you assign the second one from the from the temporary variable. So, and that way you can actually start with y, for instance. Right, you start with y, and uh, you know that I already saved y, so I can overwrite y, and uh, so the only variable that I didn't assign is x, and I assign it back from t. So you can start from whatever like order you want. Right, just remember that if you save the variable, you can overwrite it now, and you're not going to lose it. That's the idea, essentially. That makes sense. Makes sense. Hopefully. So, uh, so you can override it, and uh, and after that, finish the process by assigning the second variable, uh, something like verb uh, y equal t. There we go. And if I try to recompile the entire thing and I refresh it, everything looks good. So maybe it would be uh, better to have some sort of like a bullet point list in here, right? So um, I forgot how to do that. It's something like environment items. So this is what I remember how to, um, uh, when you assign something to the variable T. Mm. Mm, this is what I remember how to implement it is, mm. So this could be first item, right? So this is one item. Uh -huh. mm, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe it's fine. I don't know, it's, it's kind of a huge paragraph, but it is what it is. Uh, <clears throat> mm, okay. Um, all right, uh, all right. Now let's implement the bubble sort itself, right? And this one is going to be essentially code. 
and who remembers how to implement the bubble sort so uh, we're gonna start with a function that accepts array of integers right and since it's a C we also have to pass the uh, the size of the array so it's gonna be an exercise right I wonder if this entire thing will compile I think it will because uh, yeah we, we already include stdlib which includes size t Mm, can you break apart your code block and use that as part of the text? I think so. I think you can do that. Um, so uh, let me see. So I can probably do something like this. And then this one is going to be something like begin. Uh, right. And I can have some sort of a text, some text here. Uh, right. So then uh, some text there. Uh, right, some text here, some text there, and this is going to be begin code, and this one is going to be end code. Uh, yep, yep, yep. Um, and that should be fine, right? If I do something like this, some text here, some text there, and the entire thing compiles, and in the C code, it's going to look like this, right? So, yeah, you can actually split apart, you can basically comment on each individual line if you want to. Right, so yeah, because the idea is actually super simple, but I don't think we're gonna do it right now. Um, maybe. We can probably also have comments in there, but it's not particularly convenient. <clears throat> All right, so let's remove this entire thing. So this is gonna be that, uh, this is gonna be that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, uh, yep, yep, yep. Uh, Mm, so bubble sort so how we're we going to be iterating through this entire stuff so you we usually iterate first the length right so we iterate the full length then smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller so that means we're going to do four i um and this is going to be well i mean mm, let's, let's let's make it int just in case so it's going to be exercise. We're probably not going to include the last one. So it's going to be minus one. Uh, I greater or equal, actually greater than one. And then we're uh, you know, decrementing it. Uh, then I'm iterating starting from zero up until I uh, plus plus J. Right. And... Uh, Emacs is extremely annoying. <laughs> you definitely need a special text editor to edit this thing, that's for sure. Uh, if access i, uh, if access, I would say j is uh, greater than access j plus one, we have to swap them, right? We have to swap them. Uh, swap uh, access j, access, uh, J plus one. There we go. So, uh, do I want? How can it test? Is that it? I think that is it. So, do we need anything else? Um, so, let's try to recompile the entire thing, and it seems to be working. So, here is the bubble sort. <clears throat> So uh, we may also want to test this bubble sort to make sure that everything is okay. Um, so um, let's check if this bubble sort algorithm uh, works correctly. Um, let's implement uh, a function that can uh, generate generate. Um, like n uh, random uh, random numbers numbers for testing right so maybe uh, n is going to be verb something like this so and this is going to be code uh, and the function is going to be basically generate uh, generate n numbers and we're going to accept the uh, the numbers themselves and uh, like basically the n Right, and here's an interesting thing. So for the random, do we need to include some stuff for the random? Maybe not, I think it's, it's part from stdlib. Mm, and add the output 
to the dock that would be crazy the output to the dock maybe we could do that so but it's actually not really part of the uh of the literate programming i think so it's more of a like a kind of a different thing mm -hmm. so all right uh one two three four for uh this thing plus plus i so access i uh rand um mod max right uh max um x size right mm -mm -mm -mm. Mm, okay, so max x size. There we go. And we'll probably need to define it somewhere. So, <clears throat> mm. Mm, I don't know. We can probably like, put it into define max x size um, 100. We could probably. Um, have a special section for uh, like different controls and whatnot uh, but maybe we're gonna extract it a little bit later as for now uh, let's just try to recompile the entire thing and there we go we have a function that generates a number mm -hmm. uh, so so what's gonna be the next thing i suppose what we want to have in here is um, and also an ability to check that uh, the array is sorted, right? So uh, we also need uh, to be able to check that the array is sorted, uh, right? So let's write that as well. Mm -hmm. Is sorted. Uh, we're gonna accept this thing and we're gonna accept n. And how do you check that an array is sorted? Right. Uh, I suppose you iterate it by pairs, and if the pairs are ordered, it is sorted. If they're not, they're not. So we might as well even return boolean. Uh, but if I try to return boolean, this is not going to compile, uh, as you can see. So yeah, it, it needs uh, unknown name boolean. So we'll have to go back to our include section and include uh, std boolean. Right, so it's going to be std bool, uh, and then I'm going to recompile, and everything seems to be okay. So, and here we have the the entire thing. Okay, that's cool. Uh, all right, so here's the std bool, and so how we're we going to be iterating for uh, i less than n minus one, right? Because we are essentially iterating uh, all of that by pairs, right? So we're iterating all of that by pairs. Um, so. I wish there was like an easier way for me to to show that. Mm, so we need some sort of like a way to draw diagrams. Does anyone know any cool way to like any cool package in uh, in later to draw diagrams? That would be kind of nice. Um, um, right, we can do that by uh, by iterating the array with a window of size 2 and checking if the pairs are ordered uh, ordered right if the pairs are ordered so maybe we can put this stuff in here forest package before okay later forest so let's see Package forest drawing trees. Uh, so the package provides a based mechanism for drawing linguistic and other kinds of trees. Uh, so I'm not sure if it's gonna fit our goal, but maybe, maybe. Who knows? I don't know. Doesn't feel like it will. Okay. So mm -mm -mm -mm. maybe I can put and uh, code in here and then begin in here so uh right uh one two three four five uh six uh, right so something like this 
Mm, mm, mm. So, mm, ordered. Then we can swap some of these things in here. Uh, and then the next thing is going to be just moving uh, to the next one. So then to the uh, next one. And to the next one. Uh, uh, um, are ascending. Mm -hmm. So that's, hopefully that describes the process well enough. Uh, okay, so in here, I'm gonna comment out this thing for now. Uh, yep, yep, yep. So yeah, that's basically how, oh my God, it actually split it into several lines, no. Uh, how to add a page break or something. Uh, later, uh, page break. Mm, 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 mm. So I think it's literally page break. Uh, okay, so after that, I'm gonna just add a uh, page break, right? So let me see, and there we go. So that thing is gonna be like that. Mm, 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 mm. Would be nice to also, yeah. So, but that could be maybe a to do to make it a little bit better, uh, right? So, and is sorted is essentially plus plus i. Uh, right, and if access i is greater than access i plus one, you instantly return uh, false. Uh, return false. Uh, one, two, three, four, and this one is going to be true. There we go. Um, yep, yep. So might as well actually put it like this. What the fuck is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it's an underscore, so it thinks like, okay, so you need to give it some time to realize that it's a code, uh, code thing. <laughs> Thank you, Emacs, very cool. Uh, right, so, yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 go away, freaking this. So, is sorted. Um, okay, so the next thing we're going to be doing, essentially, is... Um, so we, we can generate a random shit. Uh, we can also uh, maybe check if it's sorted or not. Mm -hmm. S to the power of ordered. Yes, exactly. It's S to the power of ordered. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So latex. Um, um, how to say that? Because I want to be able to uh, to uh, somehow draw just things like that, but in later itself. Like I want to draw this sort of thing, and uh, you know what I'm talking about. And I don't want to like do SVG or like my own things. Like I just want to do that within the within the thing itself. But uh, I don't think it's possible right now. Like maybe I need a special package or whatever. Mm, maybe I need a special package, but you, you get the idea, right? So you can write some sort of an article or maybe presentation and you can embed these pieces of code and then you can have a simple tool that uh, can then turn that into the executable program, right? And uh, there you go, you can compile it and verify that it works correctly. So that's the system that I wanted to make, right? That's the system I wanted to make. And it turned out actually very, very simple. It's literally 100 lines of code. The entire thing that enabled me to just show you this thing is 100 lines of C code. Um, yep. So actually it's a little bit more because I used some of the libraries in here. So for string view library, which is uh, 300, three, uh, 250 lines of code. Um, right, so yeah. So the thing, how can we extend this entire program, right? Uh, if you make this thing, these two things, and this thing customizable for the user, 
you will be able to, again, mishmash different markup languages and programming languages. For instance, what if I say that the uh, begin, let's actually uh, put the begin and end to a separate like macros, right? So uh, begin line is going to be something like uh, begin code, right? So that's what we have here. So this is a begin line. So and the end line is essentially uh, something like this, so end code. And I'm going to literally just replace them in here, right? So, um, so this one is supposed to be uh, begin line, and this one is supposed to be end line. And the thing here is the comment, right? So uh, let's introduce something like uh, line comment, and this is going to be like this. Uh, so uh, line comment, boom. So now this thing is that. For instance, what if I want to use not, um, I mean, all of the modern languages use slash slash today anyway, but uh, not, not all of them. Uh, so here we have uh, later and uh, see like, right? Later and see like. Just by switching this thing, begin line, I can say something like uh, Python, right? And end line is going to be like this and the line comment is going to be something like this. Now I'm working with Markdown and Python. Now I can integrate, I can do the same shit with Markdown and Python, everyone. Just by switching these two things. Uh, so let's actually try to recompile and see if we can do that. Uh, right, so... Um, yeah, that would be interesting. So hello dot uh, c uh, and uh, well, that one is actually really weird. So oh, because I'm actually looking at a completely wrong thing. Okay, so let's actually rebuild the entire thing, right? So and let's create something like hello uh, dot md, right? So and let's put something like I don't know uh, inverting binary tree. Uh, in uh, Python, right? So we're inverting binary tree in Python, and then I can have Python uh, and def invert, right? So we, where I accept the root, and then something like this uh, actually pass, and then I'm gonna close the entire thing. Oh yeah, I forgot that my Emacs is very annoying when it comes to do this kind of shit. So then I can do something like lit hello md, and it will basically comment out everything that is uh, markdown related, leaving only the Python code. So, and then uh, I can take MD, right? And I can convert it to, I don't know. So, so what, what's the good markdown converter? Uh, Pandoc or something, I think. And with the Pandoc, I can convert it to, to some other stuff. You see, it only took, it only took changing three things and now i'm using a different markup language and a different programming language and we can try to take this thing and make them runtime parameters so we can have configs and you can say okay so this is my begin line this is my end line and this is my line comment and this is like why i'm so surprised like why only haskell has to be the language where it's possible right because the idea came from literate haskell right so Literally, Haskell doesn't do anything special to enable this kind of features. It's just literally very simple parsing and you can make a, like a general tool that just does this parsing for you. And that's what I just did. I, I just I just implemented the thing that Haskell compiler do, is doing and it's super fucking simple and it works on more languages and more programming languages and more markup languages. So, so yeah, that's basically what I wanted to do today, <laughs> essentially. Um, well, practical to make this configurable outside of exactly that's what I was talking about. Uh, I was talking about making it configurable outside of the, of the program. So, uh, but I'm already streaming for two hours. Uh, I just wanted to show you guys that uh, you know such a simple concept can enable such powerful things and stuff like that, and also just share uh, how I used this thing before. Um, so, and I guess I'm going to go, <laughs> right. So I'm going to upload this thing on uh, GitHub at some point, and maybe at some point we're going to make this thing configurable. 
right? So you could have like a configuration file or maybe via the flag parameters or whatnot. Um, oh, by the way, recently we're actually developed like a flag, uh, flag library. Do you guys, did you guys watch the previous stream? Uh, so yeah, I think that stream is not really available yet on yeah it's not really available yet maybe it is, it's gonna be available in 20 minutes by the way so i scheduled it to to become public in uh 22 uh, at 22 right so it's gonna be available in 20 minutes uh right so and what we did on that stream we re-implemented a go flag module right so it's gonna be go flag so it's a it's a very cool module it's a very cool module that is super simple and it just allows you to uh you know parse command line arguments we could actually just slap that module onto our program. Let's actually go ahead and do that. So uh, let me actually uh, go to here and uh, so go flag. Uh, so goes flag in C. Uh, rewrite goes flag in C video. And I'm going to do TBD. Uh, and once it's up, I'm going to actually uh, um, uh, edit here. And the implementation of that flag uh, library can be found on GitHub. I actually, I think I call it flag.h. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's flag.h and you can find it in here. It's extremely simple. It's extremely simple. Uh, so you just call corresponding functions. You want to have a Boolean, right? You want to have a Boolean. You go, you go flag Boolean, help, the default value, the description, and you get the pointer where you go, going to have the value of that thing. Then you declare all of your flags, right? And then you go flag parse and it just fills up all of these uh, memory slots and then you can just use them down below, right? It's, it's pretty straightforward. So uh, we might as well just go ahead and just slap it in here. So uh, flag h uh, source cloud, uh, source cloud, and I'm gonna just put it in here. So, and the whole implementation, I think the whole implementation of this thing is like, yeah, uh 250 lines of code like, as you can see i like to write like these very very small but powerful libraries that are like, like a couple of hundred lines of code but they are powerful right so i'm collecting powerful ideas uh, like string view or flags or something like gym i don't know if anyone remembers but gym is i think it's more than just a few hundred uh lines of code Right. Oh, well, it's also like a 400 lines of code, but essentially it's a immediate mode JSON uh, serializer, which allows you to just take any uh, like a tree structure in C and just recursively traverse and just serialize it into JSON immediately without having intermediate representation and stuff like that. So you can you can find this thing in here. I really like collecting this like very small, but yet impactful ideas, right? You know, something simple, but impactful. When will you be making is even? Well, I mean, it's not that impactful. I don't think you need a library for that. So, uh, all right. So I'm going to put this thing in here. Uh, JSON immediate serializer. Uh, maybe immediate JSON serializer. All right. So here is the flag. So let's go back to flag. Uh, mm, 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 mm. Uh, all right, so w get, and I'm gonna actually be putting it in here, right? And let's include it uh, somewhere here. So let's define um, flag implementation. Uh, impl uh, I need to open this thing first. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, then it's gonna be flag.h. And here is the thing, I'm going to take uh, this entire stuff and turn it and turn it into uh, flags. Mm. So how are we going to be doing all of that? I think I could call this begin and and comment. So obviously begin is going to be a string, right? So this is going to be just a string then and well, all of them are just strings okay so i think that's that's fair to assume that all of them are just strings uh yep so and the next thing is going to be flag str so this is going to begin the default value is going to be this and the description is 
So what's gonna be the description? Line that denotes the beginning, beginning uh, of the code block, right? And then we can have something like flag str. This is end, uh, right? Line that denotes the end of the code block. Uh, then we have a comment, uh, flag str. Maybe we're not gonna put the space in here, we're gonna put that space ourselves. Uh, so this is gonna be comment, the default value is that, uh, the inline comment of your of the programming language. All right, so we need to have a distinction between the markup language line that denotes beginning block of the beginning of the code block in the markup language, right? Uh, uh, the, the end of the code in the markup language, because essentially we have two notions in here: the programming language and the markup language. Uh, all right, so we don't need anything in here. So here are several like three flags. The next thing I need to do, I need to uh, do flag parse, right? So this is going to be flag parse. I'm going to provide argc and I'm gonna provide argv. Um, so um, since we're starting to use flags, I think we need to have a special flag for the input, right? So I'm gonna introduce it like that. So this is gonna be input, flag, str, uh, input. Um, so, and by default, it's gonna be null. Let's actually keep it null. Uh, path to the input file, there we go. So if while parsing, we had an error, what we have to do, we have to print the usage. I'm going to print the usage uh, and I'm going to print it to std error. Does usage accept any? Okay, it doesn't accept anything else. That's fine. Then uh, after that, I'm going to be printing the error to the standard error and then I'm going to be exiting with uh, one. There we go. So we don't need anything in here and stuff like that. So uh, here, when I'm printing the usage, right, when I'm printing the usage, I want to bring the usage a little bit closer, right? Um, and here we're going to do flag print options. I'm going to print it in here. Okay. Uh, cool. So here we declared all of the flags and we say that it's a string flag, it's nothing special. We parse everything. Uh, and if there is an error, we just print an error, print the usage, and so on and so forth. We also want to check if uh, the user provided the input, right? If the input is equal to null, that means the user didn't provide anything, and we have to throw an error about that. So, uh, no input, um, so maybe it's going to be error, no input file is provided. Um, right, something like this, and we're gonna exit with one. We might as well also print the usage just to tell the user how you provide the input, right? Uh, all right, is that it? Do I need anything else? I don't think so. All right, so, uh, and in here, the input is gonna be like, like this, there we go. So let's try to re recompile the entire thing, and uh, it's gonna be something like this. So what do we have in here? So it's, it's std error, uh, another one is end line. Uh, okay, so end line is essentially a C string, right? So I should be able to do SV from C, there we go, I can do SV from sister. So it's gonna be SV uh, from sister. There we go, so here's the SV from sister. Uh, so, and another thing, so we need to integrate that. So this is gonna be the line comment. Uh, we're gonna put a space in here, and then we're gonna have a comment. There we go. So here's the comment. Here's the line, and there we go. And here's just the regular line in here. So what's the, where is the next uh, compilation error? Line comment. Okay. So here we're gonna have another one, and this is gonna be just a comment. There we go. Anything else? Begin line. So uh, begin uh, SV from sister. There we go. All right. That's cool. So I think this is done. If I try to run lit, it automatically uh, uh, tells me that I didn't provide the input file, right? Uh, I didn't provide the input file. So now, um, hello, Pipe. Now, if uh, I think I forgot a very important thing, I forgot a very important thing. I forgot to say that this is an options, right? So this is options now. So this is options. Uh, let me do no build, right? There we go. So this help 
this help is generated by the flags library, right? It is generated by the flags library. And uh, we can now try to do something like input and the input is gonna be, what do I have in there? Uh, hello MD. Okay, and hello MD is not going to work because it is designed for Python and Markdown, right? So let's actually give it a try. Uh, hello MD. There we go. So you see, it just commented everything out. First of all, in Python, uh, we have comments that are, uh, you know, the, the hash signs. There we go. We just replaced uh, the, the, the comments with the hash sign style. And uh, the begin in here is basically backtick, three backticks and Python. And now it denotes the begin, but it doesn't know about the end. And I can provide the end like this. Uh, there we go. And now it works with Python. You see, now you can essentially customize uh, customize the uh, this style like this. So, and I just use my pre-made, uh, you know, flag library to do that. It was actually pretty straightforward. So, and of course I can probably do it like that. So. So that's basically what we have in here. So, and this is almost production ready thing, right? So this is how you use it now. You provide the input, then you provide the comment style, then you provide the code begin and the code end, and it's customizable at one time. And it was super fast. Uh, thank you, PIQ9117 for four months of tier one subscription. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Really appreciate it. So, Yep, that's the whole thing. We can also introduce like a help flag or something. So uh, it's gonna be flag boolean uh, help. By default, it's gonna be false. So bring this help uh, to std out and exit with zero, right? So, and then after we parsed everything, uh, after we parsed everything, um, we uh, will check right we will check that the help is actually uh, available in here right if it's actually true and if it is true uh, we're going to just print the usage to the standard output and exit with zero exactly how the um how we said that in a message right so it's it's really easy to add a new flag in here it is very easy to add a new flag and as you can see right so this is going to be something like this so you run it like that but at any point well i mean it's kind of pointless because we have mandatory flag but you can just do help and it will tell you what kind of stuff you can do in here so it's kind of interesting when you provide a string that is null by default right that is null by default maybe it doesn't make any sense to print the default as null uh, because it's kind of it's kind of weird maybe in a flag uh, right so if I do something like this so there is a function that prints the options right and if you are printing this string uh, maybe it doesn't make any sense to print it uh, if it's null right so maybe we can check if this thing is not null only then you want to print the entire thing, right? So, and uh, for that, we'll have to recompile the entire thing. There we go. So, and as you can see, if, if the default is null, it's not going to be printing it. And it's also kind of indicated that, um, you know, but, but, but I don't know, maybe maybe it's fine. Maybe it's actually fine to, to do it like that. So, um, yeah, so I haven't decided yet. Uh, so thank you PIQ91174 five tier one subs gifted. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And everyone who got the subs, welcome to our epic literate programming club. Uh, all right. Does it extract code in LaTeX files? Uh, what do you mean by that? Uh, it so essentially, you probably missed the whole stream. You probably want to watch the stream from the beginning. But the idea is the following. You have a uh, thing like this. And what this entire system does, it generates file like this, commenting out everything that is not a code block. And then you can compile it as a program. So that's basically what it is. So you can generate the executable program and documentation to that program from a single file. So this entire thing, so this is some sort of an article. But if you take each individual piece of code in this article and can concatenate it together, it's going to be a working program that compiles and actually works. So while you're writing this article, you can constantly rebuild your entire thing 
right? You can constantly rebuild your entire thing and uh, make sure that all of your code examples actually compile. And then you can distribute the like both the article and the source code. So that's the idea. And the idea is to actually make it work for any markup language and for any programming language. So that's basically the idea. Um, so does it make sense? So, and that's precisely what we did already. So, uh, yep. Mm, that's precisely what we did. Uh, so maybe the time has come to maybe, um, I don't know, test that somehow. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell. So I need to, I need, to, I want to upload this entire thing to, uh, to GitHub, but it's like a little bit messy right now. And I'd like to have a little bit more examples and whatnot. So uh, I'm not sure. It's kind of difficult for me to decide what I want to do with this kind of stuff, if you know what I'm talking about. Because uh, here we have other examples. Like I will also want to include this hello example as a demonstration of how to use this entire thing. So I'm, I'm going to start with just, you know, including only this stuff. Um, do I want to do a no build? Let's actually not include no build. I'm going to remove no build and I'm going to just leave like a make file. Uh, right, so it's going to be simple make file because I feel like later is going to be easier to integrate this entire stuff. Uh, w all w extra std c11 uh, pedantic uh, pedantic gddb. All right, and then we're going to have lit main.c and it's going to be cc c flags o lit main.c right and um okay so um mm, 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 mm. so i'm probably going to be including so this is going to be bubble right so this is going to be bubble uh and uh, i'm going to include this entire thing in here right so this is this stuff uh yep yep, yep. And there's foo.c, foo.c. Um, there's a lot of shit in here that I don't really want to include. So let's create an SRC folder. And I'm going to put everything into SRC folder that is related to this thing. Uh, right, in the make file. So this is SRC and this is SRC. Uh, all right, so this is make. Uh, and that created lit. And then with lit, you can do input uh, bubble. Right, and it produces that thing. Okay, uh, so read me. Uh, well, first let's actually release it under MIT license. There we go. Read me. Uh -huh. Simple uh, literate programming system. Uh, quick start. Uh, it's going to be console. You do make, then you do lit input. Uh, bubble tech bubble dot c uh, then you do cco minus c bubble dot c and then you do pdf later bubble dot tech okay so um uh inspired by the literate literate haskell so, and I'm going to give the link to the literate Haskell in the readme. Oh, come on. Don't be so slow. Okay. Well, there we go. Quick start. Mm. The idea is to generate uh, the um, program, the compilable, the executable program and the documentation from the same file, right? Uh, there we go. So that's how we can do that. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So I would also like to document that you can customize the um, the begin and end block, right? Mm -hmm. So let's put it this way, how it works. Uh, how it works so the uh, program just iterates uh, through the 
entire file line by line uh, and if um, okay so how to explain that I'm basically explaining the algorithm uh, line by line and comments out everything that is not inside of the uh, code block leaving um, so the program just iterates through the entire file line by line and comments out everything that is not inside of the code block uh, generating uh, so the final the final result can be passed to a compiler or an interpret interpreter does, it, does that make sense does that explain what this thing is doing well enough think of that the program just situates through the entire file line by line and comments out everything that is not inside of the code block so the final result can be passed to a compiler or an interpreter right so um the uh, uh, so the begin um, so um, the code block markers and the comment style uh, are custom uh, customizable uh, see lead help for more information there we go i think that's a pretty good explanation of how this entire shit works more or less all right so and uh yeah i'm gonna do a committee committee so i need to generate the uh the entire thing all right and let's uh, also maybe git ignore uh the lead executable and we are offline uh, luckily i am actually recording everything so it should be fine uh so i don't know what's up with that i think i kind of know what is going on so just give me a second um mm, yeah yeah we're offline completely so it is what it is and it isn't what it isn't so, but luckily, since I'm recording everything offline, I can just continue working on this thing and uh, just make a committee committee. All right, so uh, let's do ready, set, a go. And I wonder if I, I feel like I don't even have an internet right now. I think I have a feeling, just a second, I'm gonna quickly just go. Yeah, my internet is completely down. Uh, oh, it's, it's up again. Okay, it's up again. So I wonder if I can just stop streaming uh yeah, yeah yeah so i'll have to wait a little bit anyway so uh let's go ahead and create the repo let's go ahead and create the repo so where are we going to be doing all of that so it's going to be sodding uh, all right, so this is going to be lit. Uh, and where is this thing? Mm, simple literate programming system. Simple literate programming system. So this is this one is going to be public. Uh, so it, what's funny is that, by the way, YouTube people, uh, you can see that, but Twitch people can't see us, right? So I cannot reconnect my streaming. Uh, I actually said stop streaming. Right, but since uh, it stopped streaming while I was streaming, OBS have a, has a hard time to just stopping. Right, it is really difficult for OBS to stop streaming when it disconnected by internet going down. I have no idea why this is such a hard problem, but it is what it is. So I said it stopped streaming and it's still stopping the streaming. So now we have a situation when Twitch chat cannot actually uh hear us or see us but youtube people can actually see that because i'm recording all of that so uh we can say something to them so uh lol uh youtube uh people will be able to see more <laughs> uh because uh because i 
keep recording because I keep recording um, I can't restart this stream because it will fuck up the recording uh, so I guess <laughs> this stream is over for you guys thanks everyone uh, for watching uh, okay bye bye so and uh for youtube people we're gonna just quickly upload this entire thing and i'm gonna sign off and so on and so forth so uh there's not gonna be that much of an extra content anyway uh right so let's go ahead and do this entire thing um so i'm gonna add origin and uh there we go Alrighty. so and let me push that right into the repo right into the repo so uh the source code well maybe i can give that source code to twitch people as well so uh source code mm, all right and i'm gonna put that source code into the description as well source code uh like this and maybe i'm gonna put it like here or whatnot all right i guess that's it for today thanks everyone who's watching me right now i really appreciate it have a good one and i see you next time see you all next time uh so hopefully today's session was interesting uh and maybe we're gonna turn eventually this entire thing into something something usable and maybe i'm gonna use this kind of thing for different explanations and whatnot in the future but until then uh i see you all next time Love you. Mm -hmm.